Welcome back to Quantitative Analysis in Anthropology. I'm Professor Peregrine, and today we're on Topic 9, Lesson 1, talking about nominal data. Okay. Nominal data is one of the most common forms of data that we will be getting in anthropology. And if you don't remember, nominal data are categorical data. There are categories. Um, in this case, we're going to be looking at eye color, blue, brown, or uh, green. We can talk about hair color. We can talk about culture. We can talk about the state somebody or the nation some group lives in. Any of those categories are what nominal data um, refer to. There are some major issues for us dealing with nominal data, not the least of which is that we can't calculate parameters like mean and standard deviation, or variance. What that means is that all of the statistical tests that we've talked about that rely on means and variances, we can't do with nominal data. So basically, everything since topic two or three, since correlation, uh, we can't use any of those with nominal data. So that's really limiting what we can do, and that's a real problem in anthropology because we have lots of nominal data, and that nominal data can be very useful to us. So what do we do? Well, we can do a number of limited, very limited statistical tests. The most common one, and the one we're going to focus on in this topic or this lesson is the chi-squared test. Um, it's a measure really of independence, and I'll get into what that means. There's two forms of the chi-squared test. One is a measure of fit more than independence. We'll get to that. And the other one is something called lambda, which is a measure of association like correlation, uh, but it's used for nominal data. Uh, varies between 0 and 1, like correlation coefficient. So uh, we'll look at that in a little bit. And then with uh, two by two tables, and you'll understand what that is in, in a few minutes, but dichotomous variables, we can do a couple of other tests, Fisher's and uh, exact test and gamma. We're going to get at those in another lesson. Lesson two, I'll be talking specifically about two by two tables and, and how we can deal with them. They're a unique situation. One of the ways that we can analyze nominal data, and we talked about this earlier in topic two, I believe, is by visualizing it. So there's two very good ways of visualizing nominal data. One is the bar chart. So here we have eye color, blue, brown, and green, and frequency. Guess where these data come from? Hmm? Ah, you're right, Boaz from the Boaz immigrant data. With one group, Sicilians, he collected eye color and hair color. And we're going to look at those in this exercise. Um, because they're nominal data, they're categories, the color uh, here, blue, brown, or green. But so a bar chart presents the colors very well. And in this sample, Sicilians, uh, brown is by far the most common eye color, some blue some green, but mostly brown. We can see that in a pie chart. Also, where we have green being brown, the red being green, it's a little confusing, isn't it? And yellow being blue. So we can visualize nominal data, and it helps us to interpret or see patterns. More commonly, what we do with nominal data is we create tables. We have just a regular frequency table, but very often with nominal data, we do cross tables, or what are called cross tabs, which are cross tabulations of two variables. So here we have eye color, blue, brown, and green, like I charted last in the last slide with bar charts and pie chart. And then another variable, hair color, black, blonde, or brown. And what this shows us is the counts of the number of individuals in the sample that have blue eyes and black hair. There are 10. Black hair and brown eyes. There are 368. Brown eyes and blonde hair. There are 97. 
So this is showing us the frequencies in the form of what's called a frequency table, the frequencies of individuals in varying groups. A probably better way to look at this, or at least a different way, is to look at this in terms of percentages. And so here we have a percentage table that's based on rows. We can row percentage, in other words, percent of all the people in the rows. We can do it based on columns too, but rows is typically how it's done. So for people with blue eyes, 20% have black hair, 52% have blonde hair, and 28% have brown hair. For green eyes, 40% have brown hair. That's like me. By the way, for those of you who are anthropologists, you might be interested to know if you have green or blue eyes, you got it from Neanderthals, or blonde or red hair. Those are Neanderthal genes. Interesting, huh? Anyway, when we analyze nominal data, we basically have three tools in our toolkit. And all of these deal with cross-tabulations. If we don't have cross-tabulations, there are a couple of things that we can do, and we're going to talk about that next time. But really, we're stuck with cross-tabulations in terms of what we can do with nominal variables. Anyway. With cross-tabulations, we can do chi-squared, either for goodness of fit or, or independence, and we can do lambda. I'm going to start talking about chi-squared, and we're actually going to start talking about chi-squared for independence. So here's chi-squared. It's an x, chi-squared. Chi-squared, there's a formula. I keep saying I'm not going to have very many formulas, and then they keep showing up. I'm sorry about that. But I think it's useful for you to see this. Chi-squared is observed minus expected over expected. Okay. We'll talk about expected values in just a minute. In chi-squared, the null hypothesis is always that there's no difference between the observed values in a table. So what we see in the table, and if we were to go back to that table before, the, the counts of individuals in each of those categories, that there's no difference between what's observed in that table and what's expected by chance. So essentially, the null hypothesis is the pattern's random, that, it is a, that what you see in the cross-tabulation of two nominal variables is just a random pattern based on the frequencies of the various traits in the population. And the research hypothesis, then, is that there is a pattern. No hypothesis is no difference, no, no pattern. This is a little bit different than what we've seen before, but it is a sum of something minus something else divided by something else, right? This is squared, all right? This is like the sum of squared differences, and really that's what matters. If we have big differences between the observed and expected values, chi-squared is going to be big. If there's very little difference between the observed and expected values, chi-squared is going to be smaller. So what we're looking at is a bigger chi-square means that the difference between the observed and expected values is very big. And if we go back and think, when we, when we have parametric data, data with means, we're doing this kind of stuff with a case minus the mean, or the mean minus the mean, and looking at the extent to which a sample or a case differs from the larger population. We're kind of doing that here, but the larger population that we're looking at is a randomly distributed set of cases in a two by two table or in a, in a cross table. So. It's, this is conceptually, I hope you see, not all that different from what we're doing or what we've been doing. We're looking at, uh, in this case, variation from a random pattern, whereas in the other cases we've been looking at variation between an individual and a population or a sample and another sample, uh, population or two samples and a created population. That's what we've been looking at here. We're looking at the difference between what you're actually seeing and what would be expected under a, a random pattern, okay? 
When we're doing chi-squared, we have a couple of assumptions that are important to follow. One of them is that no cell should have expected frequencies less than five. That you can play with a little bit, but it can become a problem. And you cannot have expected frequencies less than one. No cells can have expected frequencies less than one. And let me just go back and show you why. If you have expected frequencies less than five, what happens is that this number is starts getting small. And because of that, if you have a big number divided by a small number, you start getting a bigger number. And if this gets less than one, then you're dividing by a number less than one. This is going to explode because you're dividing a number by something less than one. It gets big very quickly. So that's the main reason why you should have expected frequencies greater than five, and you must have them greater than one. All right, how do you get expected values then? What, how do you know if a pattern is random? Well, the expected value in a cross tabulation is the row value by the column value over total. These values are what are called the marginal values. So they are the sum of the values in that column or in that row. They're the marginal frequencies is what they're called. So here's a table with 100 cases that is distributed by chance. 50 cases have value on whatever x is of 1. 50 cases have the value on x2 of, or on x of 2, and the same for y1 and y2. And so this is a random pattern. There would be 25 cases in each cell. And we get that by multiplying 50 times 50, which is 2,500, or 200, 250 divided by 100 which is 25. So we get 25. Here's a larger table just to show you a different way of looking at that. Here's the same x1, x2. But here's now a different set of y values that now have 5. And if we do that, we have 100 cases. What we end up is we'd expect 10 in each place. So this is what a random pattern looks like. It depends on how many cases there are that score as x1 or that score as x2. They're not always distributed evenly. They, they can be distributed in lots of different ways. And we will take a look at that. OK. How do you calculate chi-squared? So let's say this is an observed pattern, where with x1, we have 40 cases in this cell. So of those individuals that score 1 on the x variable, 40 of them also score 1 on the y variable. Of those that score 1 on the x variable, 10 score 2 on the y variable. So that's our observed frequencies. We already have our expected frequencies. We would have 25 in each in this case, because we have 50 in the row and 50 in the column. And again. These numbers can vary depending on how many individuals in a sample have scores on various um, on the various uh, measures. But we have these. What we do to calculate chi-square is pretty straightforward. We take 40 minus 25 squared over 25, observed minus expected squared over expected, 10 minus 25 squared over 25. We sum all those up, and what we will get is 48. So the value of chi-squared for this observed table is 48. All right. How do we interpret that? Well, just like with t-test and with the f-test for ANOVA, we go to a table that tells us what the critical value would be given uh, an alpha level, and, and we're going to use 0 0.05. We have to know the degrees of freedom, just like we did for those other 
uh, calculations because the chi-squared distribution, very much like the F distribution, is positively squared, or positively skewed, sorry. And the number of cases underneath that 5% end changes depending on the degrees of freedom, just like with the F distribution and, and the T distribution. Okay. How do we figure out degrees of freedom? Well, degrees of freedom are the number of rows, minus one, times the number of, number of rows minus one times the number of columns, minus one. So two minus one is one, two minus one is one. So our degrees of freedom is one. And so we look at the table and we have one, 0 0.05 level of significance the critical value is 3.841. We have a value of 48. It's a little bigger. So chi-squared is greater than that critical value. We reject the null hypothesis. The null hypothesis, remember, is that we have a random pattern here. We reject that and say, no, we have another kind of pattern here. Like ANOVA, that's all we know. It's not a pattern we expect. We don't know whether we've, how that pattern plays out. If you remember in ANOVA, we go in and we look at the means and the variances and try and see where that, that set of, where the differences lie. Here we're looking at where do, does this vary from a random pattern. If we look here, each of these are supposed to have 25 cases. Well, that has a lot more than 25, and that has a lot less. That has a lot less, and that has a lot more. So there's, there's a skewing going on, sort of, that if you score higher on X, you score higher on Y. Whereas if you score lower on Y, you also, uh, Y2, you score lower on Y1. So there's a skew going on, sort of, that way, and in fact, we're going to talk about lambda, which in a sense measures that in terms of, of sort of like a correlation line, but we'll get to that later. Um, there's another form of chi-squared. That was the chi-squared test of independence, and the independence is independent from a random pattern. Chi-squared goodness of fit is kind of like a one-sample t-test, if you think about it. What you're doing is you're comparing a, a set of cases against a norm. So you've got a defined set of expected frequencies rather than ones you calculate. And then you compare a set of observations against that norm. So here we have the normative frequency. This is what's expected. There's n1, n2, n3, n4, what's normatively expected versus the observed ones, and you calculate chi-squared the same way. Observe minus expected, the normative value is what's expected. Sum those up and then uh, calculate chi-squared. Now note that in this case, you're going to have a degrees of freedom of 2 minus 1 is 1, 5 minus 1 is 4. So that's, a, that's going to have a different degree of freedom. But that's how you would calculate a, a goodness of fit. And the difference is really that one, independence is looking at a random pattern. Goodness of fit is looking at an established, this is what we expect to see. OK. I'm going to come back in a minute, and we will do an example of chi-squared. We'll also take a look at lambda real quickly. And I hope with that you'll understand this a little better. Chi-squared, I can't emphasize enough, is a really important tool to understand because you're going to use it very often. You're going to see it very often in the literature. So if you want to go back and look at this again, we'll come back and do an example of chi-squared. are back. So, gone over chi-squared, and now we're going to do an example. So the example is hair color and eye color 
whether those two are associated. The null hypothesis in that is going to be that hair color is not associated with eye color, that the two are independent. Remember, this is a chi-square test for independence, that the two are independent. The research hypothesis will be that hair color is associated with eye color. And that actually makes sense, right? Blue hair, uh, blue hair. Yeah, blue hair and blonde eyes. Blonde hair and blue eyes uh, seem to go together, and we'll see that that's actually the case here. So, here are observed frequencies. Uh, this is based on Boaz's data. Boaz collected data on eye color and hair color for a group of about 2,500, 3,000 of his uh, sub, the, the, the people that he measured, his research subjects. Um, this particular set is a, a very small subset that is just the Sicilians and just adults who were foreign born. So this is a, a small subset because it's more manageable and you can look at it more easily. What we have here then is eye color, blue, brown, green, and hair color, black, blonde, and brown, and the observed frequencies. So there are 10 individuals with blue eyes and black hair. There are 368 individuals with brown eyes and black hair. So you, these are the observed frequencies among that population of, oh, maybe a thousand people are in here. If we look at the expected frequencies then, this is what we would expect this group of people to look like if hair and eye color were just randomly associated. There was no association between them if this made a random pattern. Notice that this is different from the tables we were looking at, primarily because the expected frequencies aren't all the same. And the reason for that is that there are more people with black hair than there are with blonde hair, and there are more people with brown eyes than there are with blue eyes. And so the values in each of those cells is going to be different, because if you remember how we calculate the expected values, is we multiply the row total, I don't have it here, I'm sorry, but the row total, sorry, the row total, which I also don't have here, by the column total and divide it by the overall total. So when we do that, we get these values. That's because the column and row totals are different because more people have brown eyes, more people have black hair, so we get different values in here. Does that make sense? I hope that it does, but that's where we get the expected values. Now, we can look at these and we can already begin to see where there might be differences and that might tell us that there is an association or a, that there is uh, some kind of independent or dependence going on, that there's non-independence going on. And it, you can see that here. We're finding blue-eyed blonde people in our observed frequencies with a much greater frequency than would be expected. We would expect there to be eight blue-eyed people with blonde hair at random given the observed frequencies. What we actually have is 26. So there's far more blue-eyed, blonde-haired people than would be expected by chance. Similarly, we would expect by chance that there would be 21 people with blue eyes and black hair, whereas in fact, there's only 10 people with blue eyes and black hair. So we're beginning to see, even by looking at this, those differences. And the way that we can fully identify those differences is by doing the calculation observed minus expected squared over expected, which is shown here. These are the variances based on this formula. 
that then we sum up to get the value of pi squared. And you can see that in some of these cells, what we observe and what we expect are very, very similar. In fact, there's basically no difference among green-eyed, brown-haired people like me. We expect there to be 18 of those people like me. And there is, in fact, 17. That difference is so minimal given the large number of people that it's essentially nothing. The same, there's 347 people with brown hair and brown eyes. We'd expect there to be 339. That's so small a difference that it's only 0.2 out of this equation. On the other hand, we look at blonde haired, blue eyed people and look at the number here. We get a very big value there. That's because we see 26 of those people, we would expect there to be only eight. So looking at this, we can really see where the differences are. And what I think you can see is that it is the blue-eyed people that are really different than what would be expected, and the blonde-haired people different than what would be expected. And the two of those really go together, pulling off what otherwise would be a random pattern into what's clearly a variation from random. All right, if we look at this, we sum all these up then, all the observed minus expected squares over expected, and we get a chi-square value of 67. We want this at the 0.05 level, so we go in to a table. We see that the critical value at 0.05 is going to be 9.48. That's with degrees of freedom of 4, Rho minus 1 times column minus 1, 2 by 2 is 4. And obviously, the value of chi squared is much bigger than the critical value, so we reject the null hypothesis. And we say that there does seem to be a, a variation from a random pattern. There does seem to be um, a level of interdependence going on here where the two variables somehow are related to one another. And by looking at this, going back, and this is the same way that you do with ANOVA, the way you interpret this is you go back in ANOVA and look at the means. In chi-squared, you go back and you look at the differences between the observed and expected values, like we've been doing, and you go back and look at these values to see, wow, this is really what's creating the large value of chi-squared is blonde-haired, blue-eyed people. Those two seem to be related in a unique way. Okay. I also want to talk a little bit about another statistic you can use called lambda. Lambda is essentially a measure of association or essentially like correlation, but it's for two nominal variables. The calculation of lambda is more than we need to do in here. And what we really want to understand is how to, how to understand it and use it if we want to. So lambda, like a correlation coefficient, varies between 0 and 1. And if we look at the example that we've got with eye color and hair color, we would, if there's a lambda that's large, what you normally can do in looking at a set of observed frequencies like this is you'll see some kind of linear pattern, at least that's my experience. That you can, you can see that something's going on where there's big, 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 or small, 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 or something that's forming something like a linear pattern, because essentially you're sort of looking at a correlation. You don't see that here. If you move the rows around or the columns around to try and see if you can get a linear pattern, you're really not going to get one here because you've got these big differences but not here. So there's no way that you're really going to get blue and green to end up forming any kind of linear pattern no matter how you move these. And so the value of lambda is 0 0.036. Again, this is just like a regression or a correlation coefficient uh, so that this is small. We'd want this to be closer to one. And, and we can see that there's really nothing going on. Okay? Lambda, again, is something that you're probably not going to see very often, but it's a, a 
piece of the toolkit you can use with nominal data, and because nominal data is so important to us as anthropologists, it's really useful to know all the tools that are in our possible toolkit. That's going to be our topic next time. We're going to look at a couple of special cases, which are two by two tables. And we're going to look at a couple of other of the tools that we can use to work with nominal data. Again, because nominal data is so common in anthropological research. Having said that, chi-square is what you're going to use the most. And you're going to probably use it all the time. It is one of the most common statistics used in anthropology and I think one of the most useful uh, at, to see the variation in random from random patterns to be able to look at that difference between expected and what you observe I think is really um, useful for understanding variation and since what we're talking about is why do things vary why do cultures vary why do people vary chi-square provides a really good way of doing that, at least to me. It's conceptually pretty easy, I think, um, and visually that comparison to me allows you to, to understand variation nicely. So I would encourage you to become familiar with chi-square, come to understand it. I think it's something you're going to use a lot. Okay, that's all for today. We'll see you next time.